Hi, Don Cavellis here from Four Dog Stove Company. And what we're going to be covering is making a tin can bush cooker, which is a stove that I designed. It will be about 10 years ago, and I've been doing workshops throughout the United States to help teach people how to handcraft a simple secondary combustion, highly efficient wood stove that would allow the user to burn alcohol, any sort of biomass, and solid fuel tabs. The nice thing about this project, if a person applies himself and you know goes through the basic instructional material, they will be able to also show others how to make this stove. I have one fellow, he actually walked Appalachia Trail after attending one of my tin can bush cooker courses out in Vermont, and that's what all he used to meet all his cooking needs through the whole hike. The wonderful thing about this, it'll allow you to bring a liter of water to a rolling boil in eight to ten minutes using three ounces of twigs it allow you to use alcohol bring a liter to a boil with an ounce and a half of alcohol in six to seven minutes and it also with 14 grams of hexamine it allow you to bring a liter to a rolling boil in less than five minutes the basic components are just basically tin cans the original catalyst of the idea would have came from the old traditional hobo stove now who would I learn to make hobo stoves from well who else but a hobo? My dad had the, he was lucky enough to be dirt poor and be able to ride the rails in the early uh, 30s. He learned a great deal from them hobos and he learned one thing, to really appreciate a warmed up can of pork and beans. I've had the honor to be called an old hobo more than once. Or how do you say, bringing us into the 21st century of the hobo stove. Now the roots of how I came about with my design goes back to Dave Hancock in Zimbabwe, Africa, back in the early 80s. He was trying to develop a stove that would allow for the indigenous population in Zimbabwe to reduce their fuel requirements still, but still meet all their cooking requirements. Now the problem there is that the common grounds that it started to become because of the rise in population become completely defoliated. So he was looking for a stove that would burn normal biomass, which I mean by twigs, agricultural waste that normally wouldn't be utilized, but could be used efficiently in a stove. He looked at different ideas and he looked back at, I know a lot of you may be familiar with the old Zip stove that was developed in the 70s, still available today, which was basically a double walled stove with a small blower and a battery. But it was made to only cook 16 ounces to one uh, quart. Well, he needed something that would cook for three to four quarts for a whole family, so he took that idea and applied it use in Africa, which meant no blower, no batteries. So the stove he came up to was called a tutsu stove, which means twig stove in, in the indigenous language in Zimbabwe. He developed that in the early 80s, brought it to production. There was over 30,000 of them made. And then that was the predecessor for uh, Crispin Pemberton that took it to the next level at New Dawn Engineering. Some people call these top lit updraft or another term they use is a gasifier stove well they're neither what they basically are they have a secondary combustion okay just like all your modern wood stoves today have a secondary combustion that's basically what you're doing here because you can top lit these but if you top light them they're not as efficient and they give you more smoke if you burn it just like a conventional stove or as a technique i developed what i call my quick burn technique it works much much better the other thing, it's not a true gasifier stove. You are creating a secondary combustion by your top holes, okay? But that's not gasifier. You're just burning, and that's why they call it, another term they used in South Africa was the stove that burns smoke. Because what you'll see in the fire pot, as you have your primary burn in the bottom, you'll see smoke being generated, but then you'll see flame around the top holes and that's secondary combustion. In other words, the same principle of any modern wood stove found in your home today. A true gasifier stove is actually contained where they put the biomass in a sealed container and then the gas that's generated from an outside wood source, heat source, is then burnt. This is not that. This is secondary combustion. And the design dates back to the zip stove advance by Mr. Hancock in a larger scale, about the size of a five gallon bucket, which allowed him to bring a gallon to a rolling boil in 12 minutes or less. 
they found by using that they were able to reduce the wood consumption per day from 10 pounds down to 5 pounds for an average family in Zimbabwe. So what you'll find instead of having an open fire, you'll burn or your conventional quote unquote hobo stove, you'll burn half as much wood, get twice as much heat. What we need for components, we have a half gallon paint can, that's for our heat exchanger windshield. We have one quart paint can, which will be used for our outside shell. We have a one pint paint can, which will be our inner shell. You can go by the basic fan grate, as seen here, which was done from the bottom of the one paint, paint can. Or, as I've done on my courses, we take a disc of titanium, lay it out, cut it, and then bend the, the fins and use this because it's completely replaceable and will last forever. So when your tin can wears out, you can just put it into your next tin can. Another advancement on that is where it's been notched. So it'll actually rest down in to the inside recess of the one paint, paint can. And then what we utilize for our pot stand is a basic half inch wire fabric. As you see here, that's been cut and trimmed and then we staple it together with the items you see here, which are basically what you call your rabbit fence pliers and staples for making uh, rabbit cages. As an alternative, you can also just put it together with a little bit of wire. So that's not necessary. But if you're gonna do it for a group of Boy Scouts or Cub Scouts, it's well worth the investment. Also what we, we need is the tools to put it together. I would advise everyone to have a light pair of gloves because the sharp edges, they cut. Another thing you may want to have a few band-aids in on hand because if you're not used to working with uh, metal and the sharp edges, there's a good chance you could cut yourself. A hammer, a good pair of tin snips, a needle nose pliers, a scratch awl, a nickel to use as a template for the dimensions on your center of your grate. A basic can opener, you can actually even use a simple P38. You're going to need an old church key or as you know, we used to call, or uh, for the old beer can openers, readily available in thrift stores. If you can find them made in the US, that much better. And as you can see here, this is kind of semi-blue. And what I like to do with these, I'll get that red hot over a like, kitchen burner. Then I'll quench that in a quart of cold water. And then I sharpen the edge, just like you would a knife. And what that does, it tempers that so it'll hold an edge and make it much nicer for cutting through your uh, tin cans. Not necessary, but I find that does make a big difference. A piece of emery cloth wrapped around, it could be just a piece of plywood, uh, a piece of aluminum, and that's to take your sharp edges off of your stand after it's been cut. Then I find using JB Weld, a two-part epoxy, to put around your inside seam to lock that in place. It's not necessary, but then you know it's not gonna move. There's also alternatives to where you could use pop rivets, screws, but I find using the JB Weld the easiest and the simplest, especially if you're dealing with learners. At that point, I'll bring you right through, walk you right through the whole process, start to finish, how to make a tin can bush cooker.